let's find out a little bit more about that feather and what goes on. Chapter one, a trap to catch a witch. It was a warm night for November, too warm. A night for witches or so the story said. Witches were supposed to be extinct, of course, but Tsar had heard about the way they stank and he imagined he could smell that now in the quietness of the dark forest. A faint but definite stink of burning hair mixed with long dead mice and a little kick of viper's venom, once smelled, never forgotten. Tsar, pronounced Tsar, I don't know why spelling is weird, was a wild young human boy who belonged to the wizard tribe. He was riding on the back of a giant snow cat in a part of the forest so dark and mangled and tangled that it was known as the Badwoods. He should not have been there, for the Badwoods were warrior territory, and if the warriors were to catch him, well, what everyone said was, Tsar would be killed on sight. Off with his head, as was the pleasant warrior custom. But Tsar did not look even remotely worried. He was a cheerful scruff of a boy, with a tremendous quiff of hair shooting upwards from his forehead, as if it had accidentally come into contact with some invisible vertical hurricane. The snow cat he was riding was called King Cat, a noble creature which was a giant form of lynx. Far too dignified for his cheeky master, King Cat had shining paws so round they looked unreal. Fur so deep it was like powder snow and such a rich silver grey colour that it was almost blue. The snow cat ran swiftly but softly through the forest, his black tipped ears swivelling from side to side as he ran, for he was scared, although too proud to show it. Only that very morning Tsar's father, Enkanzo the Enchanter, king of wizards, had reminded everyone that it was forbidden for any wizard to dare set one toe in the badwoods. Tsar meant well, but he was the kind of kid who acted first and thought later, and that kind of kid is often in trouble. In fact, Tsar was the most disobedient boy in the wizard kingdom in about four generations. In the past week, Tsar had tied the beards of two of the eldest and most respectable wizards together when they were sleeping at a banquet. He had poured a love potion into the pig's feeding trough, so the pigs developed mad, passionate crushes on Tsar's least favourite teacher and followed him around wherever he went, making loud, enthusiastic squealing and kissing noises. He had accidentally burned down the western trees in wizard camp. Most of these things hadn't been entirely intentional exactly. Tsar had just got carried away in the heat of the moment. And yet none of these disobedient things was half as bad as what Tsar was doing right now. There was a large black raven flying above Tsar's head. This is a very bad idea indeed, Tsar, said the raven. The talking raven was called Caliburn and he would have been a handsome bird. But unfortunately, it was his job to keep Tsar out of trouble. And the worry of this impossible mission meant his feathers kept falling out. It really isn't fair to lead your animals and sprites and young fellow wizards into all this danger. As the son of the King Enchanter and a boy with a great deal of personal charisma, Tsar had a lot of followers. A pack of five wolves, three snow cats, a bear, eight sprites, an enormous giant called Crusher and a small crowd of other wizard youngsters all followed Tsar as if hypnotised or shivering and scared and pretending not to be. Oh, you worry too much, Caliburn, said Tsar, pulling King Cat to a halt and jumping off his back. Look at this lovely, pretty little glade here. You see, perfectly safe and exactly the same as the rest of the forest. Tsar looked around with breezy satisfaction as if they had stopped in a delightful woodland dell filled with frolicking bunnies and baby deer rather than a cold eerie little clearing where the ewes leaned in threateningly and the mistletoe dripped like warlock's tears. The other wizards drew their swords and the growling snow cat's fur stood up with fear to such an extent that they looked like little furry puffballs. The wolves padded restlessly, trying to form a protective circle around their humans. Only the smaller sprites shared Tsar's enthusiasm, but that was because they were too young to know any better. I don't know if you have ever seen a sprite, so I'd better describe these ones to you. There were five larger sprites, all faintly resembling a human, crossed with a fierce, elegant insect 
When irritated or bored, which was often, they blinked on and off like stars and purple smoke drifted out of their ears. They were so see-through, you could watch their hearts beating. Then there were three smaller, younger ones who, because they were not yet adult, were known as hairy fairies. Zar's favourite was an eager, slightly stupid little thing called Squeeze Juice. Oh, it's lovely, it's lovely, squeaked Squeeze Juice. It's the tremongously loveliest clearing I've ever seen. What's this fast, interesting flower? Let me guess, it's a buttercup. It's a daisy, it's a gerangulum, it's a cauliflower. He flew into the upper branches of a particularly gloomy and sinister tree and perched on the edge of one of its fleshy flowers, which had, had ominous spikes on the end of its leaves. It was in fact called a sprite-eating hobtrap. The flower snapped shut with the briskness of a mousetrap. Catra and poor little squeeze juice inside. Callie Burton landed on Zar's shoulder and gave a heavy sigh. I don't like to say I told you so, said Callie Burton, but we've only been in this perfectly safe little clearing in the Badwoods for one and a half minutes and you've already lost one of your followers to a carnivorous flower. Nonsense, scolded Zar good naturedly. I haven't lost him. That's the whole point about being a leader. Whenever my followers get into trouble, I rescue them because that's what a leader does. Zar climbed the tree and 200 feet up, swaying precariously on a couple of creaking twig-like boughs, he took out his dagger and popped open the sprite-eating hobtrap to release a panting little squeeze juice in the nick of time. It's fine, squeaked squeeze juice. Don't worry, squeeze juice. That's just the hob trap's digestive juices. The feeling will return in a couple of hours, Zar called out as he dropped down from the tree. You see, I'm a great leader. Stick with me and you'll be fine. The wizard youngsters looked very thoughtful indeed. At that moment, Zar's older brother, Luta, came out of the shadows behind them, sitting astride a great grey wolf and followed by even more sprites and animals and young wizard followers than Zar himself. Zar stiffened because he hated his older brother Luta. Luta was a lot bigger than Zar. He was nearly as tall as their father. He was brilliant at magic. He was good looking and clever and my goodness didn't he know it. He was the smuggest smug wizard you could possibly imagine and he often sneaked on Zar to get Zar into trouble. What are you doing here, Luta? Storm Zar suspiciously. Oh, I just followed you to see what unbelievably stupid and pointless thing my ickle bravey brava was doing this time, drawled Luta. Great leaders like me don't do pointless expeditions, fumes Zar. We're here for a reason. It's none of your business, but... Zar considered telling Luta some elaborate lie about what he was doing, but he couldn't resist showing off. We're going to catch ourselves a witch, boasted Zar proudly. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. This was the first time that Zar had mentioned to his followers the purpose of their expedition, and it was very unwelcome news indeed. A witch! The bear, the snow cats, and the wolves went very still and began to shake. Even Ariel, the wildest and most unafraid of Tsar Sprite, shot up into the air and momentarily disappeared. There are witches in this part of the Badwoods. Now I know it, whispered Tsar excitedly, as if a witch were a delightful sort of present that he was offering everyone. There was a long silence, and then Luther and his wizard followers began to laugh. They laughed, and they laughed, and they laughed. Oh, come on, Zar, Luta said at last, once he got his breath back. Even you must know that witches have been extinct for centuries. Ah, oh, yes, said Zar. But what if some of them survived and have been hiding all this time? Look, here's what I found in this very clearing only yesterday. Out of his rucksack, he carefully took an absolutely gigantic black feather. It was huge, like the feather of a crow, but much, much larger. A soft black, fading at the end to a glowing, dark, shiny green, the colour of a mallard's head. It's a witch's feather, whispered Tsar. Luther smiled his most superior smile. 
That's just the feather of some big old bird, scoffed Luther. Some giant crow. You get some weird things living in the bad woods. Zar frowned and hung the feather from his belt. I've never seen a bird as big as this one must be, said Zar grumpily. It's all nonsense, smiled Luther. Only a brainless fool like you wouldn't know that. Witches were destroyed forever. Caliburn flapped downward and landed on King Cat's head. Forever is a long word, said the raven. You see, said Zar triumphantly, Caliburn is a bird of omen who can see into the future and into the past and he doesn't think the witches are gone forever. All I know is if witches were not to be extinct for some reason, you wouldn't want to go meeting one in a dark place, said Caliburn, shivering. What do you want to witch for, Zar? I'm going to catch the witch, said Zar, and remove its magic and use it for myself. There was another horrified silence. Eventually, Luta spoke. That, little brother, is the worst plan I have ever heard in the whole history of plan making. You're just jealous you didn't think of it, said Zar. I have a few questions, said Luta. How are you going to catch the witch in the first place? That's what the net's for, said Zar, taking a net out of his rucksack and holding it up. You couldn't fault his enthusiasm, at least. One of us will volunteer to be wounded ever so slightly, and then the blood will attract the witch. Oh, great, smiled Luta. Now you're going to wound one of your sad little followers. In a forest stuffed with raving werewolves and blood-sniffing ogre breaths. Come on, you're completely crazy. This plan is as pathetic as you are, Zar ignored him. And then I'll entangle the witch in this net when it attacks. Next question. OK, question two, said Luther. No living wizard has ever seen a witch, so how do you know what one looks like? Zar opened his rucksack and took out a book the size of a large atlas entitled The Spelling Book. Every wizard is equipped with the spelling book given to them at birth. Zars was looking extremely worse for wear. One part of it was invisible. It accidentally got drumped in invisibility potion. Another bit was burned so black you could barely read it. This happened when Zar set the wizard camp on fire. And many of the pages were loose and dropping out from all over the place. Too many adventures to go into here. Zar opened the book to the contents page, which had the 26 letters of the alphabet written on it in very large gold script. Zar spelled out witches by tapping on each letter in turn. And whoo, the book turned its own pages, which seemed to go on forever and ever and ever. The chapters in front turning invisible as the book rifled through the rest of them like an endless pack of cards until eventually they stopped at the right place. That's weird. Doesn't say what they look like, but... They're green, I, I think, said Zar. Someone else thought witches could turn invisible and they had acid blood. Another that they squirted that blood through their eyes. I'm sure we'll recognise one when we see it, said Zar impatiently, shutting the spelling book. They're supposed to be pretty horrible, aren't they? Awesomely horrible, said Caliburn gravely. The most terrifying creatures that ever walked this earth. So, even if you do catch this witch, how will you persuade it to part with its magic, asked Luther. I'm imagining that invisible green acid blood squirting witches that are the most terrifying creatures that ever walked this earth will not give up their magic if they say them pretty please. Aha, uh -huh, said Zara craftily. I've thought of that. With a grand flourish, he put on some gloves, reached into his rucksack and took out a small saucepan. Silence again. You do realise that's a saucepan, said Luther. This is no ordinary saucepan, said Zar cunningly. And then he took a deep breath before he made his shocking announcement. This particular saucepan is made out of iron. Most of the wizards took a horrified step backwards. The sprite set out shrieks of alarm. Luther alone refused to be impressed. In fact, he laughed so hard, Zar thought he might fall over. This is too good. You're going to fight a witch with a saucepan, sneered Luta. You're no great leader, Zar. You're a liar and a loser. Our father is ashamed of you. And now I know why you're so keen to steal magic from a witch. There's a spelling competition at the winter celebration tonight and you can't do magic. Zar can't do magic, taunted Luta. Zahn turned red with embarrassment, then white with anger. The fact he couldn't do magic yet was one of those hidden sores that you didn't want anyone else to see. 
Wizard children were not born magic. Their magic came in when they were about 12. Zar was 13 and his magic still had not come in. Zar had tried doing magic. For countless hours he had tried. Really simple things like moving stuff with his mind. But it was as if it were a muscle he didn't really have. Relax, everyone said. Relax and it will happen. But it was like trying to move something with arms that weren't there. And recently... He had beginning to worry. What if it never happened? It was an unlikely calamity, but what a disgrace to the whole family it would be if a child had been born to the king enchanter who had no magic. The thought of it made him feel a little sick. Poor little baby Zar, crooned Luther cruelly. Thinks he's such a big boy, but he can't do any magic whatsoever. My magic will come in, his Zar. But in the meantime, I swear, he spat, eyes so small with anger that he could barely see out of them. I swear, I'm going to catch a witch and I will squeeze so much magic out of that witch, Luther, that I will blast you out of existence. Oh yeah, grinned Luther. He reached into his rucksack and took out one of his staffs. A wizard's staff was about the size of a walking stick and wizards concentrated magic through them. Your spelling won't work on me when I am carrying iron, roared Tsar, rushing forward to hit Luther with the saucepan, which was perfectly true. But most unfortunately, in his charge forward, Tsar tripped over a long tangle of bramble and his gloved hands lost their grip on the saucepan and it went sailing over Luther's head and into the undergrowth. Luther pointed his staff at Tsar and whispered the word of a spell under his breath. Luther's body trembled as the magic quivered through him and channeled out of his hand into the staff, which concentrated it into one quick, fierce, hot bolt of magic that blasted out of the end of the staff, hitting Tsar on the legs. Tsar stopped mid-charge. His feet stuck to the ground by Luther's spell. <laughs> laughed Luther's followers. Remove the spell, shouted Tsar, struggling to shift his feet. But it was as if they had turned to lead. No, I don't think I will, smiled Luther. Tsar lost his temper. He snapped his fingers. Mm. Before anyone could blink or think, King Cat launched himself at Luther. Huge jaws agape, 60 stone of silvery grey killing machine. Screaming in terror, Luther was pinned up against a tree trunk, looking aghast at the great cat's nightmare face, inches away from his own, and what felt like four kitchen knives sinking into his shoulder. They had already drawn blood. None of Luther's own sprites or animals had time to move or protect him. One more click of my fingers, Spatzar, and King Cat will take off your head. Cheat! panted Luther. You cheated. You're not supposed to use your animals to attack a fellow wizard. Remove the spell, shouted Tsar. Luther was now every bit as angry as Tsar himself, but what could he do? He pointed his staff at Tsar and removed the spell so that Tsar's feet could move, and then Tsar made a signal to King Cat to let Luther go. You're mad, a lunatic, raged Luther as King Cat dropped him and Luther gazed in astonishment at the four neat bleeding puncture wounds in his shoulder. Your animal has bitten me. If you dare to enter that spelling competition, I am going to annihilate you. Luther turned to Zar's followers. Who wants to come with me rather than staying here with this silly little madman and his stupid witch trap, shouted Luther. One by one, Tsar's followers backed away from Tsar and towards Luther and climbed on board their walls or snowcats, muttering things like, sorry, Tsar, this is a bit too crazy even for you. And if witches aren't extinct, they are bad magic, Tsar. We shouldn't be here. You see, crowed Luther triumphantly. A great leader has to have someone to lead and no one wants to follow a magiclessly lunatic. Good luck with meeting your witch loser boy. And then Luther rode away on the back of his wolf, followed by most of the other wizards. Cowards, roared Tsar, nearly crying he was so angry. He ran into the undergrowth to re retrieve the saucepan and shook his fist at their departing backs. We'll show you, we'll catch a witch, we'll take magic from it and there will be so magic we'll fly without wings. 
Tsar turned with a sigh to the bedraggled remains of his followers. Why did Luther have to spoil everything? Tsar had hardly anyone left now, only three young wizards whose magic hadn't come in either. A girl called Heliotrope and two boys, Rush and Darkish, a large lad with even larger ears, who had reached the age of 17 without showing any signs of magic whatsoever and who was slightly on the dim side. Bother. He's left me with the losers, tottered Tsar. Here, I say, Tsar, that's a bit unfair, protested Rush. Well, we really fly without wings, said Darkish, flapping his big arms up and down. Of course we will, promised Tsar, rubbing his hands together excitedly, for Tsar could never stay down for long. Those cowards are going to be so sorry they left. Darkish, you're the biggest, so you need to do the most digging, ordered Tsar. Rush, I'm afraid we're going to have to wound you a little to tempt the witch into the tra trap. And if anything goes wrong... I thought you said this mission was completely safe, said Rush suspiciously. <gasps> wound? Well, nothing is entirely safe, Tsar. Backtrack quickly. Life is dangerous, isn't it? After all, you could get killed just climbing a tree like I was nearly just now. This is not climbing a tree, sputtered Caliburn from above, as the three young wizards began to obey Tsar's ordered orders. This is intentionally trespassing on warrior territory, trying to set a trap for the scariest life form that has ever walked this planet. Caliburn sighed. Nobody was going to listen to him. Caliburn perched rigid on the tree branch with his head under his wing, as if for a long time as he buried his head under there, if he couldn't see the future, the future would not happen. But of course, the old bird knew that that would not work. See you again soon.